Well, they come as if from outer space in a variety of weird geysers. Games like Pac-Man. No human could begin to compute how many Pac-Man dots were gobbled up. If you thought Pac-Man had gone about as far as he could go, look out. People will tell you that Pac-Man is the greatest video game ever made, from the design of the level to the way the characters act. But what if the game itself is just a small part of what made it a phenomenon? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't afford a full-sized one, but that's okay. This is the current craze game, Pac-Man. I think there's a lot of historical context that explains why Pac-Man was more than just a hit game, why it was a cultural phenomenon, and that context is key to understanding why Pac-Man won. I want to go through the four main ghosts that Pac-Man defeated to become an icon. But let's clear the deck, I mean none of this would have happened if Pac-Man had been a bad game. Pac-Man was particularly awesome. We're talking about video games. They come in all shapes and sizes, and are called things like Pac-Man. I asked a lot of you for your Pac thoughts, and you told me that you loved being part of the thrill, you praised the intuitive mechanics and labeled it the Rubik's Cube of video games. So I'm not going to critique the design here, um, a lot of you recommended Action Buttons, three hour review and uh yeah it's uh pretty in depth and i won't nerd out on aesthetics of the game here either um for example jj mccullough's narrow deep dive was hilarious and fascinating and i can't top that even though we were told to regard the pac-man bad guys as monsters they looked more like ghosts to us i'm calling them ghosts by the way all that said i think you can hold pac-man as being a super special game and still believe that the timing, the historical context, is the thing that made it iconic. Pac-Man's late 1980 release in US arcades was perfectly timed for it to be a phenomenon. The first ghost Pac-Man had to defeat? Pinball. Friend of the channel, Jacob Ross, at uh, Jacobian's and Starfighter's Arcade, which is his awesome looking arcade in Arizona, he helped me explain some of the Pac history and he got some Great shots of their amazing collection of Pac-Man related games. Of the many Pac-Man spin-offs they have there, one is called Baby Pac-Man. Baby Pac-Man is an oddity, a combination of video game and pinball machine, uh, and it is the perfect illustration of the crossroads that the arcade industry was at. In the late 70s, pinball was the undisputed champion of the arcade. I combed through a bunch of issues of Playmeter, a magazine for the coin man. Yes, coin man is the term that they used uh, to describe the people who were running the arcades and watching the costs. Check out the State of the Industry issue from 1979. Video games definitely existed. Here's a Space Invaders ad that's right on page two. But in 1979, it was still pinball, pinball, pinball. The pinball rankings were twice the size of the video game rankings. And all the cartoons were pinball focused. While pinball promised the hottest kiss ever, the pinball industry was already very sensitive to its video counterpart. And they were kind of right to be afraid. Pinball was about to be passed by video games because video games offered a lot to arcade owners, more than just a new type of game. Profits, profits, profits were the main thing for an arcade owner. I like this 1981 video game ad because it shows some of the things that the typical coin man valued. Even though this ad's for a mini machine, I think the same thing applies for video games versus pinball machines. A coin man loved space savers, more revenue per square foot. Video games were way smaller than pinball machines. Video games were profit makers as a result, and that made them market openers. They could appear in places that pinball machines just couldn't. Things changed really quickly. This is uh, from a survey in 1980. I'll make video games blue and pinball red. Average weekly gross from video games was even with pinball in 1979, and here in 1980 it totally passed them. Now look at the new purchases graph. New purchases of video games almost doubled pinball machines. And in late 1980 in the United States came a beautiful family of Pac-Man video game machines. Pac-Man had the perfect timing to vault to number 5 in the March 81 sales poll. 
By May of 1981, it was the number one game in America. Pinball defeated. Like many other crazes, electronic games have created a lively controversy about their impact on young minds and lives. So this clip is from a half hour discussion of uh, video games being terrible. This was Pac-Man's second ghost, Fear. A lot more than video game playing goes on there, according to city police. In the last six to nine months, there have been a rash of these places cropping up. Back in pinball days, coinmen frequently dealt with the negative tinge of operating coin machines. That almost got worse with arcades. Those places are long on profit, but short on supervision. Enter Pac-Man. Now, even sweet Pac-Man had critics. Pac-Man as the modern Pied Piper is how a cartoon portrayed video games last fall. But Pac-Man did offer some solutions to the arcade problem. Let's look at the November issue of Playmeter. Pac-Man was just more family friendly than Armor Attack or Cosmic Adventure. And remember, we're in an age when this type of game was seen as violent. This is part of the reason Midway, Pac-Man's US publisher, followed up Pac-Man with the Ms. Pac-Man brand. The game reportedly appealed to women more than other games and they wanted to build on it. Playmeter said women rejoice when sales of Ms. Pac-Man were catching up in 1982, the year of her release. The point here isn't that Pac-Man and Ms. Pac-Man got more people into arcades, it's that the industry had every reason to rally around the diversification of their user base. Pac-Man beat fear. This next part gets a bit technical, but Pac-Man beat out conversion kits. Let me explain. Let's say you're an arcade owner and you buy a machine from a big company. You get a quarter every time someone plays the game, right? As players get better, or if a game is too easy, you're getting fewer quarters. So if you could tweak the machine to make the game harder, you get more quarters, you make more money. But the arcade manufacturer is then losing out on the sale of a new game. In the early 1980s, conversion kits or speed up kits like this, they became a real problem for game makers and a boon for arcade owners. As this ad shows, having to buy new games was cutting into profits. So video conversion kits were an answer. For arcade owners, this technical stuff wasn't too daunting. Look at the original Pac Manual. Get it, Pac Man, you will. That's a good one. You gotta admit, that's a good one. It's got circuit board info right on there. There was a hacker ethos in this culture. Collectives formed to make these conversion kits. Uh, one big one was General Computer Corporation, uh, but that fancy name is kind of a joke because they were just a group of MIT dropouts. They had success with this conversion kit that upgraded Missile Command, and they knew that Pac-Man was a huge potential market. Miss Pac-Man happened because a group from General Computer Corp hacked the original game and added their own mazes, and they originally called it Crazy Auto. Crazy Auto was a conversion of Pac-Man, and the law on this kind of thing, it was kind of unsubtle. Um, let me let GCC co-founder Steve Golson explain it. Our code overlaid on top of the existing Midway Namco code. They patched Pac-Man to make it better with their own design, Crazy Auto. But now think about that from the perspective of the people selling those Pac-Man arcade machines. Midway, which put out Pac-Man in the US, they hated kits. Here's a 1981 ad they took out in Playmeter, warning arcade owners how they had stopped game kit entry into the United States. And this Playmeter article quotes a lawyer saying, we have 40 different judges in 40 different courts who have ruled in our favor. There have been no dissensions. As a result of that and other precedents, the Crazy Auto Gang had to try to sell to Midway. Hey, we're gonna buy this kit from you and maybe we'll do it as a new game. Crazy Auto became Ms. Pac-Man. Pac-Man won because Ms. Pac-Man ate up those conversion kits and there's just one ghost left. This is a guy called Casey Munchkin. Now we're getting into the territory of home systems like the Magnavox Odyssey 2, where Casey Munchkin first popped up in 1981, but I think it matters for why Pac-Man won. Casey Munchkin was a lot like Pac-Man. 
The manual shows some very Pac-Man-y stuff, but KC is different from Otto, right? Otto has that Pac DNA in his coat, but Munchkin didn't. He was just a copy. There was no law against that at the time, right? I'm not a lawyer, but let me walk you through the text of a memo uh, from one of the lawsuits. This is Atari and Midway versus Phillips, maker of Magnavox and Casey Munchkin. Pac-Man was suing Casey Munchkin for infringement of a copyright and unfair competition. Here's an exhibit showing the similarities between the two games. I will skip the part of the memo where they explain the Pac-Man gameplay, though I do think that should be a part of the LSAT from now on. Uh, anyway, the result, October 1982, Pac-Man zaps competitor. The court decides for barring further sales of KC Munchkin. This set a precedent, or at least a strong warning, for home video games and arcade games that copying was not okay. Now my point here is not to give you a law degree, there are a lot of further twists in this story, a lot of other cases that ended up happening, but what it does show, I think, is that Midway and Atari were aggressive in saying that you can't copy games that closely. So Pac-Man <laughs> ate the copycats, just as the arcade boom went bust. An estimated $7 billion in quarters were plunked into machines in 1982. But now it appears it's all falling back to earth. Arcades had a recession and then a video game bust followed, but Pac-Man endured. Why? There is a rare spin-off quiz game called Professor Pac-Man, and I think it actually explains it really well. Jacob tied it all together for us. Professor Pac-Man? Yeah, I don't know what the hell they were doing there. <laughs> My real takeaway is that Pac-Man, this awesome game with a funny, fun character, all that success still required Pac-Man to gobble those four ghosts. He had great timing against pinball. He soothed big fears about games. He attacked conversion kits and he defeated copycats. When we talk about Pac-Man, we often appreciate only the design of the character or the way the gameplay worked. That was a big deal, but to me, that is like only looking at Pac-Man's speed or the power pills. The level, the historical context, that matters too. All right, that is it for this one. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't been here before, this is a personal channel where I post personal videos, history videos, stuff like that. Hey, thanks to all of you for giving me your uh, pack thoughts, gave me some perspective, got a lot of great video recommendations that I included in this video. Um, and also thank you so much to Jacob for giving me that footage. I've been nerding out on his channel uh, over the past week and it's made a fun diversion. So I encourage you to do the same. There are links in the description. Um, there's a reaction video up now on Patreon. I do those and hopefully there are credits uh, somewhere around me as well. I, I've been putting that in, so thanks to the Patreon supporters for that. All right, thanks for watching. Bye.